Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mama Wears Athleisure. I am your host, Mariella de Santiago, a first time mom. We focus on all things mom with tips to help make life easier and more organized for all you mamas out there. Hi, everyone. Today we have Sarah Marie from Entering Motherhood Podcast, who is also a VBAC doula. So for those of you that don't know what a VBAC is, we're going to learn all about it today. We're going to figure out what this means, how this would affect you, which it would affect about just over 30% of the population if you have had a C-section and are planning to have another baby. My name is Sarah Marie, and I had my daughter back in 2019, and she was actually born by a completely unplanned cesarean. So I had gone in thinking, I'm going to do this unmedicated, and I'm going to have a natural birth, and all of these things are going to magically happen. And sure enough, I had ended in a cesarean with her. And then I later went on to become a doula. I got super involved in the birth community and interested in all things motherhood. I started my very own podcast and I was having all these conversations and I specifically got certified as a VBAC doula when I was preparing to give birth to my son who was born in 2022 And he was a completely unmedicated vaginal birth. So a VBAC is a vaginal birth after cesarean. And that is exactly what I sought out to do with him and and what had come. And so now I help moms on their journey of doing the same thing. And I also do other births as well. And I do postpartum care. So I absolutely love doing what I do. And I keep on finding more and more information out about everything and spreading the knowledge. It's crazy how having a baby can really spark this interest in a world that was so foreign before you became a mom. And now, I mean, obviously it consumes us because we're raising these tiny little humans. So we have to figure out how to raise them and keep our sanity. But it's so nice to also have this interest and be able to support moms that are new to it or just now going through it. So. Yeah, completely. It's it's kind of like providing that resource for what you wish you had at that time. Yes, that is so true. So with that, let's start off while well, you already said what a VBAC is. So who would qualify for a VBAC? Yeah. So it it really kind of depends on who your provider is, what kind of answer you're going to get in those situations. But honestly, majority of the time, if you have had a cesarean, you are eligible to have a VBAC. And most of the time we hear the term POLAC, which is trial of labor after cesarean. So some providers will kind of say, not like, oh, you're trying for a VBAC. They'll say you're going to like TOLAC or try for trial of labor after cesarean. So some providers will kind of, I would say, amuse the idea or say that they are willing to try for a VBAC. But then there are a couple of things that can alter that decision or change their opinion. And I would say unless something has happened to your uterus or there is like a true reason that is going on with your cervix or the placement of your placenta has a lot to do with it. But other than that, you should be able to try. There are more likely, so the type of incision that you have had There is either the incision that's horizontal and low, which is normal for what is being done right now, but there used to be the traditional incision that was actually vertical down and like kind of from your belly button downwards. And that was more likely seeing issues of uterine rupture. And that will be kind of like one of the main reasons that people are telling you you can't have a vaginal birth after cesarean because of uterine rupture, but there are cases of uterine rupture in vaginal deliveries as well with no prior cesarean. So there's sort of a a wide range of answers for that. (laughs) 
I think you're right. Everything is always so specific to the individual. Like what is your health? What is your pregnancy? Like you can be completely healthy and just have a, a super tough, challenging pregnancy. And there really is just no way to determine whether you like are going to need or have a C-section or I guess really this other than going through it. Right? I will say about 80% of moms who try for a VBAC are successful. So you might have a greater chance than you think. <laughs> well, that's good because I was going to say, so I feel like you already answered my question about who may not be a good candidate for a VBAC. Is there anything else that somebody would want to take into consideration to determine if they would or would not? Yeah, I think honestly, and like the more that is being done and the more, you know, even sometimes a lot of people have heard, you know, if you're having twins or multiples that you're, you know, immediately you have to have a cesarean and there are more and more people of twins that are actually having vaginal births. So even that isn't something to rule out a vaginal delivery for. Breach delivery is being taught more and seen more and shown. So that is lowering the risks or lowering the rate of cesarean as well. So there are a lot of different things that maybe have been seen to have the need for a cesarean delivery that there are more you know, individuals going through that process, showing that it is possible to have vaginal deliveries. Well, I am glad that you mentioned that because instantly, I mean, I think, oh, if you're having twins, you just are used to hearing that, yes, you're automatically going to be scheduled for a C-section. So that's, I feel encouraging for anyone out there that is pregnant with multiples that you, and if you want to deliver vaginally, that you may be able to. Yeah. And situations like that, I say they're like ideal VBAC candidates. Like if you had twins your first time and you had an automatic scheduled cesarean, I say there is no reason why you shouldn't be trying for a vaginal birth if you're having a single baby the next time around, because you have no idea how your body is going to labor and how it's going to happen. And with a VBAC, it's almost as if you are a first time mom again, and you're laboring for the first time, you're going through a lot of those things, especially if it was straight away scheduled cesarean, because you never even experienced labor. So you don't even potentially know what a contraction is like, or you don't know what's going to happen or how your body is going to be. And so you might be going through it as if it's your first time because it really is. Yeah. You make so many valid points. Like you have absolutely no idea what your body is going to go through. And I would like to add that this is probably a little bit embarrassing and shows my like na- lack of knowledge. I had no idea like what a Braxton Hicks contraction was. And I was like, oh, is like my baby just holding his breath in there? I don't know. Why is my stomach so hard because you don't know what you don't know and so it is so nice to be able to have resources doulas other people that can teach you these things that providers just don't really have the time to do in a 10 15 20 minute visit however long your visit is to see a provider right you're with them for only a few minutes so the amount of questions that you have or the amount of information that you don't even think about asking because you have no idea Yeah. Yeah. I had been going through, I went and did another like childbirth education course when I was preparing for my son's birth. And in that course, it was the same person that had taught a different course for my daughter. And she had made the comment like, oh, Sarah, you can kind of skip over this section and everything because like you've already done this. And I like messaged her afterwards because I wasn't comfortable like sharing to the group at that time. Like I had not, yes, I had a baby, but I had not vaginally birthed her. And so I messaged her and I said, actually, like I had a cesarean for my first. So I don't know what you're talking about. And I think like, that's something too, like, unless it's kind of known or said, some people don't even know that you had a cesarean for your first birth. And so your, your scar isn't something that's like very plainly visible. It's, 
it's even sometimes now like scars are so small that even in a bikini, you can't see them or they might have faded. And so you don't even really know how somebody has birthed their baby before. And so comments like that were a little like hard to kind of process and go through, or a lot of people make like assumptions about what a cesarean is or why you had one and things like that. And so it was something that I had to also personally go through and, and really have that conversation with myself and other people around me about what was going on and why I was interested in having a vaginal birth. Yeah, so many things that you just don't really realize. And you made just another good point about how you may not be very comfortable, but I think the more that you are in this space, like for you now being a doula and having the knowledge that you have and having a parenting podcast, like you learn to just be a lot more vocal and not really have like shame or embarrassment for what you do or don't know. It's just knowledge. Mm -hmm. So- Speaking of knowledge, if somebody is considering a VBAC or wants to, what should they keep in mind? Like, I, I also had a C-section first time around and then just kind of thinking, you're so used to hearing like once you've had a C-section, you can only have C-sections and maybe that's clearly like an older thing now. It, we're past that. But what should somebody consider? Because there's so many things that run through your mind. Are you feeling pretty overwhelmed with all of the information out there related to pregnancy and postpartum. I get it. I've been there, which is why I created the Learning to Mom podcast so that first time moms can be informed and educated on pregnancy and birth without feeling overwhelmed. Hi, I'm Layla, the creator and host of the Learning to Mom podcast. It is so nice to meet you. Essentially, I was the first of my friends to become a mom, so I really kind of had to figure out a lot of it by myself. So allow me to come alongside of you and be your mom friend and take some of the stress off of you by asking experts in the field of prenatal health, all the first time mom questions for you. Each week I'm joined by an expert in the field of prenatal health and I ask them questions that you have. So search in learning to mom podcast, wherever you're listening to this podcast on, and we can go be mom friends. I think first and foremost, if you want to have a vaginal birth, if that is something, you know, in your mind and and something that you're wanting, that is a huge decision in itself. And it's something to really, I guess, like take time to ask yourself, like, do you want to have a repeat cesarean or do you want to try for that vaginal birth? And it's, it's something that you really have to have like that, that deeper conversation about, but I think everybody, if if that's on your list, it, it should be something that you really kind of go into. But we have to also kind of heal from our cesarean. And we have to learn ways of like adding more mobility, maybe. I had no idea what scar massage was until I started going for my VBAC and I went to a pelvic floor therapist and they showed me different scar massages and they did a cupping technique and we really went through healing my scar. And I had no idea that that was something to consider, something to do, something to be aware of. And I feel like it made a lot of a difference in the elasticity of my scar and the mobility of my scar and the visibility of it. And so that's something that I always like, first and foremost, like if you've never heard of scar massage, go ahead, look it up, do that. And then just like really prepping your body physically and mentally for, for what's to come and what that really entails. Yeah, so many good points. So I also never even knew what a pelvic floor therapist was until after I had my son and I started this podcast. So even after having a kid, there's so much that you just don't know that is out there available and supportive. Like, yes, that just because you didn't deliver vaginally doesn't mean that a pelvic floor therapist wouldn't do you any good. Like they have so many great tools and ways of helping you heal, provide you with like the techniques that you need to help with that scarring. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a big misconception that people don't realize that you could still need pelvic floor therapy, even though you didn't have a vaginal birth and you're still having a lot of pressure on your pelvic floor. When you're carrying a baby, you're still going through a lot of different changes. And so if that isn't being addressed and you are having issues in that area, then it, it's something that can be helped or corrected. Yeah. So uh, thanks for bringing all of that up. Cause I feel like this is like a whole lesson on everything that we should be aware of, or that can help you, especially with that C-section. So can a VBAC be safe then after a C-section? I mean, based off of this, then yes, it can be, but in what situations, I guess, Yeah, you I, say? I always say there's just as many risks involved in having a repeat cesarean as there are in having a VBAC because cesarean is a huge abdominal surgery. You're going through surgery, whether you see it like that or not. And so you're still having an incision. You're still ripping through layers in your, in your body and you're still having that recovery, which could be more strenuous on your body than a vaginal delivery. And so when you're kind of like saying, is it safe? It's comparing like, how safe is it compared to the alternative, which would be a repeat cesarean. And the chances, like, obviously, like, you know, like I talked about the uterine rupture, if you have a scheduled cesarean and you don't put that pressure on your uterus, sure, that eliminates your chances of a uterine rupture. But it's also super, super small of a percentage. I believe it's less than 1% that is actually like uterine ruptures being seen. And then you're still risking a hysterectomy or hemorrhaging afterwards. There, there's different scenarios that can come into play. And it's just, again, like looking into your provider and, and seeing where you're birthing, where you feel safe to birth and, and what the risks are involved with that more than anything. Great comparison, but yes, you're comparing it to what is safer, another C-section or trying this route. So again, it gives you a different perspective that I guess you wouldn't, that I, I just didn't think of like for me. It's just worded differently and it makes you think about it in a different way where you're like, yeah, I guess that is true. It's, it's The comparison is just a C-section or should I try vaginally? And you hear about so many successful VBACs. So it's clearly it, it works. It's okay. It's safe. We have many moms out there. I have a few friends that, you know, have gone through that recently. So I do have a question from a listener, Jasmine. So one of the questions was, should a C-section be scheduled if the baby isn't here at 40 weeks after having had a C-section already your first time? Yeah. So that kind of like brings in the topic of induction. And again, it really depends on providers and things like that. And so some providers will be against induction for VBACs for again, that uterine rupture scenario, but there are different ways that you can try to naturally induce. And there's different things that you can be doing. I always say like eating dates is, is super helpful in like reducing like the length of labor and red raspberry leaf tea is one of my favorites in strengthening, strengthening the uterus and really giving you that, that strength that you need during labor. And so there are some things that, you know, again, like you can, you can look up different techniques and different ways of like naturally inducing labor, but it's going to be one of those things like, does your provider feel comfortable having an induction if you're, if you're getting closer to that point? And also what was the scenario for the cesarean in the first place, you know, like, was it scheduled at 39 weeks? And so you don't know how long your body naturally is actually pregnant for some people go well past 40 weeks. And so that's really kind of like, again, like listening to your body, seeing what you feel comfortable with, and what you feel is safe. And, 
you know, there are, there are different alternatives. I know somebody who recently just, you know, surpassed their induction scheduled induction date because they were like, you know what? Like, I think I want to naturally go into labor. And I think like, it's going to happen. Like she felt like it was going to be past that date. And so she had rescheduled it. And sure enough, she ended up having her baby before that day. Sometimes if you're too, you know, stressed or worried or nervous about like a specific date that they have to be there for or by, then it can just add on extra pressure. And and that could be stalling you from being able to fully relax and and have your baby. So, so really kind of like considering like, I would say like what's more right for you and what feels good for you and what are you comfortable with in that scenario? I love all of that. And (laughs) yeah, the stress, right? We talk about this all the time. Like stress really has a big, oh, I don't even know what the word is that I'm looking for. It not influence mom brain. This is mom brain. (laughs) It really does. Yeah, it really does. Like your mental preparation, I say is just as important as your physical preparation. A lot of people focus on like, you know, walking or doing squats or like, you know, really preparing physically, like learning all the different positions and things like that. But there is so much going on in our minds that is just as important to prepare for and focus on. So it it can play a big part in in preparing and, and having your baby. Yeah. Well, last question. Any tips, suggestions, or recommendations? Anything that would just be helpful for somebody that's possibly wanting to or, you know, going to go through this if you've already had a C-section your first time? Obviously, you need to have a C-section in order to be able to have a VBAC the second time around. But (laughs) yeah, yeah. And like, and I think that that's exactly it. Like, you can only have a VBAC if you've had a cesarean. And so like, if you're on this journey, if you're preparing for it, like definitely, I mean, like if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me. I've created a whole VBAC preparation guide that I really kind of like put through like with my clients and and have them on. But I think the most important thing is just like finding support and finding somebody that you can ask these questions to and talk about it through finding a really good provider finding somebody that you feel safe and comfortable with and that knows your intentions and and what you're really hoping for because that's going to play like such a such a huge role in in the whole journey. Yeah, and last time we talked I had told you like I didn't know that there was such a thing as the VBAC doula. So if you do have the access or the ability to get a doula and are going to go through this, like maybe see if you can find one that is knowledgeable in this specific area. So Sarah, I'm going to link all of your, I'll link your podcast and your website. So anyone that is listening can go to the show notes and find all of your information. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for chatting. Yeah, I absolutely love talking about this and I can I could go all day about like just different things and not only VBAC, but just like birth and postpartum and motherhood. And it's it's a fun journey. It is. And it's always changing, right? <laughs> they grow too fast. And yeah, it's fun. But yes, <laughs> tiring. Well, thank you so much. It was great chatting with you. You too. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week for our next episode. You can find us on Instagram for more updates and tips. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and give us a review if you like us.